Hume is one of my favourite philosophers. In fact, he's one of almost everybody's favourite philosophers. And I need to try and say something about the reasons why. He's a pleasure to read. Uh, he's very deep. He's very honest. He doesn't fudge problems. He goes for the jugular. He goes for the heart of the problem. Uh, and he often says surprising things, and it's puzzling to work out exactly what he's saying very often. I mean, I think he's very clear, but uh, perhaps that's after spending half a lifetime reading him. Hume uh, lived uh, from 1711 to 1776. He was one of the great British empiricists. Empiricists mean that he um, prioritised experience in the formation of knowledge. He didn't think we had innate sources of knowledge, he didn't think we had what philosophers call the a priori, uh, at least not to any significant extent. He made an exception for a little bit of logic, a little bit of mathematics, but otherwise all our knowledge derived from our experience. And it derived in interesting ways, and part of the greatness of his first book, The Treatise, is the thoroughness with which he explores uh, the way in which our experience can give rise to knowledge. Uh, and for Hume, and this is what makes him so quintessentially modern, uh, this wasn't because we reason uh, in some sort of um, uh, necessary way, a way that's bound to give us the truth. It's rather because, like animals, we have habits. We have habits of expectation. Um, when we find regularities in our experience, for example, uh, we uh, make causal interpretations of the universe. Uh, but that's not because we've found causes, it's because we express our confident expectations uh, by talking about patterns which are causal and by inter interpreting our experience in terms of causation. If you introduce a student to Hume through the inquiries, and especially through a very late work, the dialogue, wonderful dialogues concerning natural religion, um, then I think they can get on all fours with Hume, they can get on his wavelength quite easily. Uh, the self he found to be very elusive. There was no experience of the self from one moment to the next. There were just the particular perceptions of the moments, one following another, but one different from another. So how could we form a conception of an abiding self? Uh, and Hume wrestled with this problem. It was one of the few problems, actually, that he confessed he wasn't quite confident about his solution uh, of it. Um, otherwise, he was fairly relaxed about um, philosophical problems and believed that he'd got uh, a proper approach to almost all of them. I think then the only sort of challenger to his title as the greatest philosopher of the modern period would be Kant, Immanuel Kant. But Kant had the most extraordinary respect for Hume. Um, Kant um, uh, um, lays into uh, early critics of Hume, people like Thomas Reed, James Beattie, as having completely misunderstood him. Kant thought that nobody understood Hume properly until he, Kant, came along. And it was probably true, actually. Um, so, you know, they're comrades in arms in many ways. In book two of the treatise, to return to that, he tried to do for the passions what he felt he'd been able to do for our cognitive functions. Um, and this is part of his work which is of extreme interest and importance today. He had a very complex view of the passions. He didn't think we just, as it were, see things and then go whoosh and sound off or feel desire or aversion. He thought we had very complicated sources of passions and very complicated uh, feelings and emotions in response to those complicated sources. Uh, and then the third book of the treatise is about morality and that too is one of the um, uh, the parts of Hume's philosophy of great contemporary interest. Um, in morality, he's uh, what in contemporary terms is known as an expressivist. He doesn't work so much in terms of moral knowledge as in terms of the um, moral opinions that we form, which are themselves emotional, and uh, it's charting the way the moral emotions relate to other emotions, but, uh, largely via, uh, for example, the notion of convention, the notions of artificial institutions which we erect in order to, in, in a sense, cooperate and exact good behaviour from each other. There's much else to Hume's philosophy. He was a historian, he was interested in aesthetics, 
He was also one of the great figures, of course, of the Scottish Enlightenment. And finally, not least, he was a wonderful stylist. It's 18th century style, it's not easy for everyone, but once you get into it, you'll find it just flows like honey, and it's a wonderful experience to read Hume on almost anything.